Canto four, book five, The Legend of Artigal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer, book five, The Legend of Artigal, Canto four. Artigal dealeth right betwixt two brethren that do strive, saves Turpine from the gallow tree and doth from death reprive. Whoso upon himself will take the skill, true justice unto people to divide, had need have mighty hands, for to fulfil that which he doth with righteous doom decide, and for to maister wrong and precent pride, for vain it is to deem of things aright, and makes wrongdoers justice to deride, unless it be performed with dreadless might, for power is the right hand of justice truly height. Therefore, while on to knights of great emprise the charge of justice given was in trust, that they might execute her judgments wise, and with their might beat down licentious lust, which proudly did impugn her sentence just, whereof no braver president this day remains on earth, preserved from iron rust of rude oblivion, and long time's decay, than this of Artigal, which here we have to say. Who having lately left that lovely pair, and linked fast in wedlock's loyal bond, bold Marinel with Florimel the fair, with whom great feast and goodly glee he fond, departed from the castle of the strand, to follow his adventure's first intent, which long ago he taken had in hand, nor wight with him for his assistance went, but that great iron groom, his guard and government, with whom as he did pass by the sea shore, he chanced to come, whereas two comely squires, both brethren, whom one womb together bore, but stirred up with different desires, together strove, and kindled wrathful fires. And then beside two seemly damsels stood, by all means seeking to assuage their eyes, now with fair words, but words did little good, now with sharp threats, but threats the more increased their mood. And there before them stood a coffer strong, fast bound on every side with iron bands, but seeming to have suffered mickle wrong either by being wrecked upon the sands, or being carried far from foreign lands, seemed that for it these squires at odds did fall, and bent against themselves their cruel hands. But evermore those damsels did forestall their furious encounter, and their fierceness pall. But firmly fixed they were, with dint of sword, and battail's doubtful proof their rights to try, nor other end their fury would afford, but what to them fortune would justify. So stood they both in readiness thereby to join the combat with cruel intent, when Artigal, arriving happily, did stay a while their greedy bickerment, till he had questioned the cause of their descent. To whom the elder did this answer frame? Then weet ye, sir, that we two brethren be, to whom our sire, Milesio by name, did equally bequeath his lands in fee. Two lands which ye there before you see, not far in sea, of which the one appears but like a little mount of small degree, yet was as great and wide ere many years as that same other isle that greater breadth now bears. But tract of time that all things doth decay, and this devouring sea that naught doth spare, the most part of my land hath washed away, and thrown it up unto my brother's share. So his increased, but mine did impair, before which time I loved, as was my lot, that further mate, had filterer the fair with whom a goodly dower I should have got, and should have joined been to her in wedlock's knot. Then did my younger brother Amidas love that same other damsel, Lucy Bright, to whom but little dower allotted was. Her virtue was the dower that did delight. What better dower can to a dame be height? But now, when Philtra saw my lands decay, and former life had fail, she left me quite, and to my brother did elope straightway, who taking her from me, his own love left astray. She seeing then herself forsaken so, through dolorous despair which she conceived, into the sea herself did headlong throw, thinking to have her grief by death bereaved, but see how much her purpose was deceived, whilst thus amidst the billows beating of her, twixt life and death, long to and fro she weaved, she chanced unwares to light upon this coffer, which to her in that danger hope of life did offer. The wretched maid that erst desired to die, when as the pain of death she tasted had, and but half seen his ugly physiognomy, 
gan to repent that she had been so mad for any death to change life though most bad and catching hold of this sea-beaten chest the lucky pilot of her passage sad after long tossing in the seas distressed her weary bark at last upon mine isle did rest where i by chance then wandering on the shore did her espy and through my good endeavour from dreadful mouth of death which threatened sore her to have swallowed up did help to save her she then in recompense of that great favour which i on her bestowed bestowed on me the portion of that good which fortune gave her together with herself in dowry free both goodly portions but of both the better she yet in this coffer which she with her brought great treasure sith thence we did find contained which as our own we took and so it thought but this same other damsel since hath feigned that to herself that treasure appertained and that she did transport the same by sea to bring it to her husband new ordained but suffered cruel shipwrack by the way but whether it be so or no i cannot say but whether it indeed be so or no this do i say that what so good or ill or god of fortune unto me did throw not wronging any other by my will i hold mine own and so will hold it still and though my land he first did win away and then my love though now it little skill yet my good luck he shall not likewise pray but i will it defend whilst ever that i may so having said the younger did ensue full true it is what so about our land my brother here declared hath to you but not for it this odds twixt us doth stand but for this treasure thrown upon his strand which well i prove as shall appear by trial to be this maid's with whom i fastened hand known by good marks and perfect good espial therefore it ought be rendered her without denial when they thus ended had the night began certes your strife were easy to accord would ye remit it to some righteous man unto yourself said they we give our word to bide what judgment ye shall us afford then for assurance to my doom to stand under my foot let each lay down his sword and then you shall my sentence understand so each of them laid down his sword out of hand then artigal thus to the younger said now tell me amadas if that ye may your brother's land the which the sea hath laid unto your part and plucked from his away by what good right do you withhold this day what other right quoth he should you esteem but that the sea it to my share did lay your right is good said he and so i deem that what the sea unto you sent your own should seem then turning to the elder thus he said now brasidas let this likewise be shown your brother's treasure which from him is strayed being the dowry of his wife well known by what right do you claim to be your own what other right quoth he should you esteem but that the sea hath it unto me thrown your right is good said he and so i deem that what the sea unto you sent your own should seem for equal right in equal things doth stand for what the mighty sea hath once possessed and plucked quite from all possessors hand whether by rage of waves that never rest or else by rack that wretches hath distressed he may dispose for his imperial might as thing at london left to whom he list so amadas the land was yours first height and so the treasure yours is brasidas by right when he his sentence thus pronounced had both amadas and philtra were displeased but brasidas and lucy were right glad and on the treasure by that judgment ceased so was their discord by this doom appeased and each one had his right then artigal when as their sharp contention he had seized departed on his way as did befall to follow his old quest the which him forth did call so as he travelled upon the way he chanced to come where happily he spied a rout of many people far away to whom his course he hastily applied to weed the cause of their assemblance wide to whom when he approached near in sight an uncouth sight he plainly then descried to be a troop of women warlike dight with weapons in their hands as ready for to fight and in the midst of them he saw a knight with both his hands behind him pinnowed hard and round about his neck and halter tight as ready for the gallow tree prepared his face was covered and his head was bared that who he was unneath was to descry and with full heavy heart with them he fared grieved to the soul and groaning inwardly 
that he of woman's hand so base a death should die. But they, like tyrants, merciless the more, rejoiced at his miserable case, and him reviled, and reproached sore, with bitter taunts and terms of vile disgrace. Now when as article arrived in place did ask, what cause brought that man to decay, they round him gan to swarm apace, meaning on him their cruel hands to lay, and to have wrought unwares some villainous assay. But he was soon aware of their ill mind, and drawing back deceived their intent. Yet though himself did shame on womankind his mighty hand to shend, he tailors sent to wreck on them their folly's hardiment, who with few sources of his iron flail dispersed all their troops incontinent, and sent them home to tell a piteous tale of their vain prowess turned to their proper bale. But that same wretched man, ordained to die, they left behind him, glad to be so quit. Him Talus took out of perplexity, and horror of foul death for night unfit, who more than loss of life he dreaded it, and him restoring unto living light, so brought unto his lord, where he did sit, beholding all that womanish weak fight, whom soon as he beheld he knew, and thus behight. Sir Turpine, hapless man, what make you here? Or have you lost yourself, and your discretion, that ever in this wretched case ye were? Or have ye yielded you to proud oppression of women's power, that boast of men's subjection? Or else, what other deadly dismal day is fall on you, by heaven's hard direction, that ye were run so fondly far astray, as for to lead yourself unto your own decay? Much was the man confounded in his mind, partly with shame, and partly with dismay, that all astonished he himself did find, and little had for his excuse to say, but only thus. Most hapless well ye may me justly term, that to this shame am brought, and made the scorn of knighthood this same day. But who can scape what his own fate hath wrought? The work of heaven's will surpasseth human thought. Right true, but faulty men use oftentimes to attribute their folly unto fate, and lay on heaven the guilt of their own crimes. But tell Sir Turpin, now let you amate your misery, how fell ye in this state? Then sith ye needs, quote he, will know my shame, and all the ill which chanced to me of late, I shortly will to you rehearse the same, in hope you will not turn misfortune to my blame. Being desirous, as all knights are wont, through hard adventures deeds of arms to try, and after fame and honour for to hunt, I heard report that far abroad did fly, that a proud Amazon did late defy all the brave knights that hold of maidenhead, and unto them wrought all the villainy that she could forge in her malicious head, which some hath put to shame, and many done be dead. The cause, they say, of this her cruel hate, is for the sake of Bellodant the bold, to whom she bore most fervent love of late, and wooed him by all the ways she could. But when she saw at last that he no would for aught or naught be won unto her will, she turned her love to hatred manifold, and for his sake vowed to do all the ill which she could do to knights, which now she doth fulfil. For all those knights, the which by force or guile she doth subdue, she foully doth entreat. First she doth them of warlike arms despoil, and cloth in woman's weeds, and then with threat doth them compel to work, to earn their meat to spin, to card, to sew, to wash, to wring, nor doth she give them other thing to eat, but bread and water, or like feeble thing, them to disable from revenge adventuring. But if through stout disdain of manly mind, any her proud observance will withstand, upon that gibbet, which is there behind, she causeth them to be hanged up out of hand, in which condition I right now did stand, for being overcome by her in fight, and put to that base service of her band, I rather chose to die in life's despite, than lead that shameful life unworthy of a knight. How height that Amazon, said Artigal, and where, and how far hence doth she abide? Her name, quoth he, they Radigund do call, a princess of great power and greater pride, and queen of Amazons in arms well tried, and sundry battles which she hath achieved with great success, that her hath glorified, and made her famous, more than is believed, nor would I have it weaned, had I not late it prieved. Now sure, said he, and by the faith that I, to maidenhead and noble knighthood owe, I will not rest till I her might do try, and venge the shame that she to knights doth show. Therefore, Sir Turpins, from you lightly throw this squalid weed, the pattern of despair, 
and wend with me, that ye may see and know how fortune will your ruined name repair, and knights of maidenhead, whose praise she would impair. With that, like one that hopeless was repried from death's door, at which he lately lay, those iron fetters wherewith he was guyed, the badges of reproach he threw away, and nimbly did him dight to guide the way unto the dwelling of that Amazon, which was from thence not past a mile or tway, a goodly city, and a mighty one, the which of her own name she called Radigon. Where they arriving by the watchman were descried straight, who all the city warned, how that three warlike persons did appear, of which the one him seemed a knight all armed, and the other two well likely to have harmed. Eftsoons the people all to harness ran, and like a sort of bees in clusters swarmed, ere long their queen herself, half like a man, came forth into the rout, and them to array began. And now the knights, being arrived near, did beat upon the gates to enter in, and at the porter, scorning them so few, through many threats, if they the town did win, to tear his flesh in pieces for his sin, which when as Radigund their coming heard, her heart for rage did great, and teeth did grin, she bade that straight the gates should be unbarred, and to them way to make, with weapons well prepared. Soon as the gates were open to them set, they pressed forward, entrance to have made, but in the middle way they were immet, with a sharp shower of arrows which them stayed, and better bad advice, ere they assayed, unknown peril of bold woman's pride, then all that rout upon them rudely laid, and heaped stroke so fast on every side, and arrows hailed so thick that they could not abide. But Radigund herself, when she espied Sir Turpin from her direful doom acquit, so cruel dole amongst her maids divide to avenge that shame they did on him commit, all suddenly inflamed with furious fit, like a fell lioness at him she flew, and on his headpiece him so fiercely smit, that to the ground him quite she overthrew, dismayed so with the stroke that he no colours knew. Soon as she saw him on the ground to grovel, she lightly to him leapt, and in his neck her proud foot setting, at his head did level, weaning at once her wrath on him to wreak, and his contempt that did her judgment break, as when a bear hath seized her cruel claws upon the carcass of some beast too weak, proudly stands over, and a while doth pause to hear the piteous beast pleading her plaintive cause. Whom when his article in that distress by chance beheld, he left the bloody slaughter in which he swam, and ran to his redress. There her assailing fiercely fresh, he wrought her such an huge stroke, that it of sense distraught her, and had she not it warded warily, it had deprived her mother of a daughter. Now the less for all the power she did apply, it made her stagger oft, and stare with ghastly eye. Like to an eagle in his kingly pride, soaring through his wide empire of the air, to whether his broad sails, by chance hath spied, a goshawk, which hath seized for her share upon some fowl, that should her feast prepare. With dreadful force he flies at her belive, that with his source, which none endure and dare, her from the quarry he away doth drive, and from her gripping pounce the greedy prey doth rive. But soon as she her sense recovered had, she fiercely towards him herself gan dight, through vengeful wrath and stainful pride half mad, for never had she suffered such despite. But ere she could join hand with him to fight, her warlike maids about her flocked so fast that they disparted them, maugre their might, and with their troops did far asunder cast, but amongst the rest the fight did until evening last. And every while that mighty iron man with his strange weapon never want in war them sorely vexed, and coursed, and overran, and broke their bows, and did their shooting mar, that none of all the many once did dow him to assault, nor once approach him nigh, but like a sort of sheep dispersed far for dread of their devouring enemy, through all the fields and valleys did before him fly. But when as day's fair shiny beam, he clouded with fearful shadows of deformed night, warned man and beast in quiet rest be shrouded, bold Radigund, with sound of trump on height, caused all her people to surcease from fight, and gathering them unto her city's gate, made them all enter in before her sight, and all the wounded, and the weak in state, to be conveyed in, ere she would once retreat. When thus the field was voided all away, and all things quieted, 
the elfin knight weary of toil and travel of that day caused his pavilion to be richly pight before the city gate in open sight where he himself did rest in safety together with sir turpin's all that night but talus used in times of jeopardy to keep a nightly watch for fear of treachery but radigund full of heart gnawing grief for the rebuke which he sustained that day could take no rest nor would receive relief but tossed in her troublous mind what way she mote revenge that blot which on her lay there she resolved herself in single fight to try her fortune and his force assay rather than see her people spoiled quite as she had seen that day a disadventurous sight she called forth to her a trusty maid whom she thought fittest for that business her name was clarin and thus to her said go damsel quickly do thyself address to do the message which i shall express go thou unto that stranger fairy knight who yesterday drove us to such distress tell that to-morrow i with him will fight and try in equal field whether hath greater might but these conditions do to him propound that if i vanquish him he shall obey my law and ever to my law be bound and so will i if me he vanquish may whatever he shall like to do or say go straight and take with thee to witness it six of thy fellows of the best array and bear with you both wine and yunkates fit and bid him eat henceforth he oft shall hungry sit the damsel straight obeyed and putting all in readiness forth to the town gate went where sounding loud a trumpet from the wall unto those warlike knights she warning sent then talus forth issuing from the tent unto this wall his way did fearless take to weeden what that trumpet sounding meant where that same damsel loudly him bespake and shewed that with his lord she would imparlance make so he them straight conducted to his lord who as he could them goodly well did greet till they had told their message word by word which he accepting well as he could weet them fairly entertained with curtsies meet and gave them gifts and things of dear delight so back again they homeward turned their feet but Artegall himself to rest did dight, that he mote fresher be against the next day's fight. End of Canto 4, Book 5, The Legend of Artegall